in a family of mostly eccentric musicians, then graduated from computer engineering in the 1990s and worked in various tech companies before retiring at age 30. Pete, his wife, and their now 11-year-old son live near Boulder, Colorado, and they've not had real jobs since 2005. This begs the question, of course, how? How did they do that? They accomplished this early retirement by doing a number of things, but in effect, optimizing all aspects of their lifestyle for maximal fun at minimal expense, and by using basic index fund investing. Their annual expenses, on average, total a mere $25,000 to $27,000, and they do not feel in want of anything. So again, since 2005, all three of them have explored a freeform life of interesting projects, side businesses, and adventures. In 2011, Pete started writing the Mr. Money Mustache blog about his philosophy, which has grown to reach about 23 million different people and 300 million page views since its inception, since its founding. It has become a worldwide cult phenomenon with a self-organizing community and incredible news coverage. This episode explores his story, philosophies, and routines. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with the one and only Mr. Money Mustache, Pete Aidney. Pete, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. It's an honor to be on here. And you are, I would say, in the top five most requested guests for this podcast that, uh, that that I see on the internet and beyond. I had somebody come up to me recently in New York City, of all places, he said, you know you should have on the podcast, and it was you. And so I'm really excited to dig into all sorts of stories and conversations and discussions because I'm thinking through many areas of my life in which I think you are an expert or have certainly spent more time ruminating on these things. But I thought we could start with your experience getting groceries. <laughs> Could you describe for people what your experience looks like getting groceries? Uh, well, it's kind of varied, but I feel strongly about groceries. So in an ideal like uh, utopian grocery day, I would throw my bike trailer onto the back of my single speed bike and roll down to like the local kind of hippie natural grocery store and then just load up with like 150 bucks of awesome stuff and then pedal it back up the hill and then unload it and then have people show up and a giant barbecue that night and uh, feast. <laughs> so if that's the utopia, what does the, what does the compromised utopia look like? Well, it's usually pretty close to that, but sometimes people don't come over or sometimes uh, there's some reason I have to use the car and maybe I'm taking, taking it past the grocery store. So I'll rush in and get some stuff. But I think the, you know, the thrust of the question is like, does this guy really uh, get groceries by bicycle? And it's definitely true. I kind of do everything by bike here in Longmont, Colorado, like at least 99% of my trips uh, away from the house here are human powered. And uh, that's just the way I've figured out makes me happiest to live. Mm -hmm. And at, at this point in time, you have a, a household of three. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. One boy. One boy. One girl. A and... Got it. All right. And and what uh, what is the? Because I think this is this is uh, this is going to be a, a core piece of the discussion. What are your average annual family expenses at this point? Would you say? Right. Well, we've been adding this up ever since I started writing a blog. We never really added it up before, but it always comes out around twenty five to twenty seven thousand dollars of annual expenditures, uh, with the notable exception that we don't have any kind of mortgage or debt or anything. So. That's all on purely stuff that we want to buy. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll, we'll, this is going to be memento style in terms of chronology as a lot of my conversations <laughs> are. It's just a quirk of my brain that I'm trying to, a bug I'm trying to tur turn into a feature of this podcast. What was the blog post or the day that you realized Mr. Money Mustache had a cult-like following. Was there, and I use that, I use that in a uh, complimentary way, by the way. Uh, you have some of the most diehard fans I've ever encountered. Uh, was there a particular piece or moment when you realized how strongly and uh, how devoted your fan base was? I think it's kind of been like one of those frog in hot water situations <laughs> where it just gradually happens and then 
occasionally, especially when my friends stop in on a, like a money mustache event, they're like, dude, you're a cult leader. Did you realize that? It's, but it didn't really happen any specific time. I would say the first time I was really surprised by the effects of blogging was when I had a, a guest post on this awesome previous uh, blog called Early Retirement Extreme. And a whole bunch of this uh, Jacob bloggers fans came over to mine, my blog, and just flooded it and just crawled and read every single article and started putting in all these comments. And and then I, it was really a rewarding thing. And I, it just kept going from there. It's sort of a self-motivating thing. Um, and then the other incident was probably we had a party once, a blog-related meetup in uh, in Ottawa, Canada, which is kind of one of my homeland, hometowns. And uh, all these people came, like 200 people, and it overflowed into the backyard of this like unwitting host's place. And uh, it was a little weird because I didn't even get to meet anybody. And that was the first time I became uncomfortable with like, oh, well, I didn't want to be one of those people where you don't even meet everybody who wants to meet you. <laughs> So Ottawa, uh, I've actually spent a, a, a decent amount of time in Ottawa, uh, and if, and I had a beaver tail for the first time while ice skating or planning on ice skating in Ottawa due to a startup there. Well, it's a quite a large company now called Shopify. Shopify. Oh, oh yeah, right. I knew that. Yeah. yeah, and the beaver tail, that's the right way to do Ottawa is skating and beaver tails. And now, beaver tail is... I don't even remember exactly what it is, but it's a pastry, right? I mean, it's, uh, what is it exactly? It's like a chocolate covered pastry. Uh, and for those people who have not been to Ottawa, you can, you can skate for hours. I mean, it's this, this gigantic, uh, I guess they lower the water level or maybe they raise the water level so that you can skate effectively around the entire city. If, if I, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, uh, that's right. And it's pretty awesome. The, uh, the but to, to get back to the blog, what what do you think has what are the aspects of your philosophy or your writing or your persona that have struck such a chord? Well, it's funny you should ask that because the first time I ever did a talk, like a big public talk, it was uh, to a conference of bloggers. It's called FinCon, and I just stopped by because it was in Denver, and uh, I'd realized that this blog was kind of behaving like a cult, and then I looked up like what are the properties of a cult, and then I read some articles and maybe a book or two on cults. And I realized, man, I've accidentally done it. <laughs> and, uh, and just because that's my idea of a sense of humor is, uh, so it turns out if you want to start a cult, you need to just have a few key elements, like a recognizable leader you need to have a sense of us versus Zen them, you know, like, Oh, we're an oppressed people and the rest of the world doesn't understand us. And a couple other things that helps to feel like you're virtuous uh, and have some kind of like good changing the world and the rest of the world needs your help. And uh, yeah, so if you look at all the cults, including informal ones like Star Trek or uh, Apple, there's always these same kind of characteristics. And I accidentally emulated those and in retrospect realized, hey, well, I guess that was a pretty good idea. So for those who are part of the us in your case, what is, what's the belief system? What are the, yeah. uh, the tenets? Right. So the belief system, which I jokingly call mustachianism, it's kind of like a lifestyle and a fake religion. And the beliefs are that the, you know, sort of the uni United States especially is the ground zero of this consumer insanity that has overtaken all of our minds. And it's just causing people to behave in an irrational way and sort of sabotage their own ability to have a good life. For example, you, they work way more years than they have to because they're consuming a lot more crap than they have to without actually getting any life benefit about it. Over and then the same thing applies to the health, their health and their their sanity and their mental health. They're everyone's very inefficiently going about their lives. So the correction uh, through mustachianism is just being a bit more thoughtful about this stuff and seeking efficiency in the way that you spend your money and make sure that you get fun out of it each time that you spend something. And uh, applying this, you just end up a lot healthier and wealthier and able to retire from mandatory work at a much earlier age in your life, which a lot of people are drawn in by the prospect of an extra four decades of freedom that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but you retired effectively at age 30. Is that right? Right. Yeah. This is perfect reverse chronology, just like you planned it. So yeah. <laughs> now we're back to the year 2005. And um, after working about a 10-year career in software engineering, my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and I uh, determined we had enough money saved up to live off the investment returns forever. 
So we just quit our regular cubicle jobs and just in time to have our baby boy at the time. And that was, of course, about 11 years ago. And we didn't even know this was a weird thing to do. We thought, oh, yeah, well, of course, you know, when you get paid as much as we do, like it only takes so long until you don't need to work anymore. And it was only after several years of retirement that we noticed that we were kind of oddballs and everybody else uh, who earned the same amount of money was still broke. <laughs> Broken in probably more way than one. Uh, and, and I want to dig into some of the, the numbers related to this. So as a discussion point, one of the, one of the things you, you had said over, and I always ask guests for potential prompts for, for, for topics that could be fun to explore. And one of them was you only need to accumulate 25 times your annual spending to retire forever. Could you elaborate on that and how, uh, how you arrived at that number? Because I, th I think this is, this is a useful exercise for people to hear. Yeah, this is a core piece of math that is very, uh, it's widely known if you're a financial independence enthusiast, but it's almost uh, completely secret to most of the, of the rich world's population. So if you, have a, if you have a handle on your annual spending and you know how much you need to live on, all you need to do is save up 25 times that amount. And on the very, very conservative side, let's say 28 times that amount, uh, in conservative investments like a giant Vanguard index fund. And that's enough to fund you with passive income with a high degree of safety if, for the rest of your life. So if you have a, to just keep the number simple, if you need $30,000 to live on, multiply that by 25 and, oh darn, I'm giving myself a tricky math question. <laughs> I think you know, it's like $750,000 you'd need saved up or something like that mm -hmm. to to quit forever. And that's a lot less than most people think. Most people at least in my age group, they're shooting for the tens of millions uh, type of range if they if they were to ever quit work early and they haven't really done the math on how easy it really is. Mm -hmm. And what are, are there any assumptions embedded in that in terms of percentage annual yield and so on? What are what are the uh, whether historically based or otherwise? What are what are the are there any other assumptions embedded in that? It is, yeah. There's, um, it's kind of based on a really long-term study of the stock market, dating back to the 1920s or something like that, or maybe even earlier. And the idea is, it goes up some years, it goes down some years, consistently pays dividends. And in the worst case scenario, you want to still not run out of money. So that's where the four percent comes from. It would have gotten you through a lot of the worst case scenarios. There were some situations when you could have spent up to five or seven percent of your portfolio every year and still not run out if you had happened to retire just before a big stock market boom that went on for a long time but most people don't like taking a huge amount of risk so the four percent or 3.5 if you want to be extra conservative with today's stock market valuations that's more of a, a safety net and it's really just a mental crutch because what i find is that when people retire early Almost everybody, like over 95% of people still have a lot of interests and passions, and then they're pretty good at making money if they manage to save up that much in the first place. So they still make money in their, quote, retirement. They just have a lot more fun doing it. And uh, that nest egg that's pumping out dividends and returns just adds extra confidence so they can they can have more fun in the process. Well, I've, I've read two different definitions of retirement, uh, or maybe their characteristics that are, I think one was attributed to, one was written by you, both of which I thought were very helpful as a orientation for thinking about the subject. And the first is, you know, retirement or financial independence simply means that you have your living expenses covered by non-work income, right? Part one. Yeah. Part two is definition of a modern retirement, the activities you pursue once you are done searching for money. Right? And uh, I think that's a very useful framework if in particular, you're considering an early retirement uh, at, at, say, the age of 30, 40, 50, whatever it might be. Um, the How do, let's say, media, not to cast aspersions on everyone who is part of <laughs> the media, since I suppose that's what I am right now at this moment, but you've been covered a fair amount, and I know, like everyone who's been covered a fair amount, you get misquoted or people get the message wrong, or they just take snarky cheap shots. Uh, 
occasionally. It doesn't happen all the time. You've actually had some of the most complimentary profiles I've ever read. But where did they get it wrong? Where do people get you, your message, your principles, philosophies wrong? Well, the, the misconceptions are sort of two different things. From the media side, they often assume, well, I mean, the ones that aren't complimentary, they assume, hey, there's this crazy guy and he's just a lifestyle guru, just like another junior Tim Ferriss trying to get everybody excited about his crazy ideas <laughs> and he's not really retired. Or or they say, yeah, he he made so much money, but that doesn't apply to the regular person when they're, you know, when they're trying to make it on like $50,000 a year salary or what about people with more kids? So um, the media don't understand. They, they often assume some kind of extreme frugality that would be undesirable to live under. And uh, that's, that's really inaccurate. And I, I work pretty hard to fight it because I don't have my spending set up for the minimal level. I have it set up for the maximum amount that I can possibly spend and get value out of it, you know, because it's easy to make money. So I set my spending at the maximum happiness level and then stopped spending when I stopped getting more happiness. So that's the, that's really the fundamental mistake. And then as for the the non-media world, they're a little bit more suspicious. Like they just think I'm make every, making everything up and, and I don't even, you know, I never did any of this stuff that I say I did in the first place. So then it's more of a conspiracy theory if you're reading like the comment section of MSN, which you should never do. <laughs> uh, you ha but you do have, uh, and, and I think this is why, this is part of the reason I wanted to bring it up very early, a, by most standards in the United States, a low household annual expense, right? Right. And uh, it, it might be helpful here to talk about, because I... I asked during our sound check what you had for breakfast. So could you repeat your answer, please? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, my, my breakfast was a fancy black espresso with foamed milk uh, and coconut, coconut oil foamed into there, too, and then some dark chocolate, like 90% dark chocolate, and uh, some nuts, almonds, and cashews and stuff. And uh, it's not exactly related to uh, low expenditure, but... It's indirectly related. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to it. What type? But since I, I love the particulars, what type of coffee? What type of chocolate? Do you recall? Oh yeah. Well, right now my co coffee is some kind of organic-y fair trade thing, but bought in a large quantity from Costco, which is obviously a lot cheaper than getting uh, like a Starbucks equivalent every morning. And uh, yeah, the nuts are from Costco as well. Now that you mention it. So this is the 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 reason I bring it up is that. Uh, and I think stumbling upon happiness or stumbling on happiness by Daniel Gilbert is is a good exploration of this. Oftentimes what we think will make us happy does not make us happy. And we can talk I, we should dig into what happiness is for you because I think it's it's it can be a dangerously nebulous term. But the point being that to to have a functional car and then to have what society tells you is the optimal car, say some type of sports car, it, there's a massive delta in price and you pay some severe penalties for that. But to have a, a to go from a good chocolate to an excellent chocolate to world class chocolate, it might only be the difference of ten or twelve dollars, right? And so there there are there are places where you can optimize without being obnoxiously or frugal or frugal in a dis, to a disabling extent and derive maximal pleasure. That's the point I was trying to make. Is that uh, yeah. And what I would love to hear from you is for those people out there who are spending far more, multiples more than you are per year, who don't know where to start, are there any easy optimizations that could have a dramatic impact on their ability to get closer to uh, optimizing for happiness as opposed to uh, succumbing to internal or external pressures to remain on this treadmill of, of overconsumption. Yeah, right. And this might actually be a better answer for your earlier question too, because as a, an engineer, like I was kind of born part engineer at least. And for me, optimization is really, really fun. It's like beautiful. And when something is not optimized and when something's inefficient, I actually find it offensive and ugly. So I had a lot of joy. I get a lot of joy from looking at each of my life spending decisions and being comparing it like, okay, if I get this car, 
I'd probably make me about this happy and this car would make me this amount happy. Whereas if I ride my bike, it does this other thing. And you do, you apply that to food and housing and transportation and clothing, travel, exercise. And then all these categories can become super efficient where you end up getting incredible happiness out of them. Uh, and the cost can sometimes be not only low, but sometimes you'll get paid for doing stuff that other people spend tens of thousands of dollars to do. So if you're a beginner at this sport of optimization, you can just start with the stuff that costs you a lot of money. So my favorite one to be a bit repetitive is the car because uh, the average middle income American spends like $12,000 per household, which is just on driving around in these like gas powered racing wheelchairs. And um, that's more than they even invest in, in their future. Like that's more than they're spending on their freedom. So step one, don't have a car that's worth more than about 10,000 bucks at the most, um, unless you're at least like a, a single millionaire, preferably multimillionaire, because you can get a great, perfectly great car that'll be trouble free for 10 plus years for under $5,000. So the reasonable ceiling would be 10. And that's already going to be a pretty giant thing for people. And then number two is don't use that car a lot. So everybody assumes that, you know, a short drive to work is anything under an hour. Whereas I think I encourage people to take a really, really hard line approach on that because it's a giant factor in life happiness and fitness and money. And my rule is you should never get a job, you know, unless you're at gunpoint that requires you to drive to it, like either find a new job, find a place to live near that job. I mean, even if it requires moving to a new city or a new country in the long run, you just got to keep that nagging thing in your mind like okay i drive to work now but this is not optimal in the long run i will optimize away car dependence and uh yeah just start with that one and then you can move on you can read stuff on my blog and figure out how to cut your grocery costs down and, and your housing and everything like that too but i really like the mobility because there's fitness involved too you know and there's there's happiness of forcing yourself out into the fresh air every morning as soon as you you give up the cage of the car. It's such a huge thing. And it's such a overlooked thing in our country. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think the, um, the, uh, it forces you to make other decisions. Like you pointed out, I haven't had a car for <sighs> close to three years. I want to say now, uh, that does not mean I don't spend time in cars. I do. Uh, so I, I tend to use whether it's a get around for trips to Tahoe or things that are further away that require some travel or Uber, but I probably walk, walk, I tend to walk more than I bike, uh, for whatever reason, but that's, that's typically, I'd say 70, 80% of my locomotion. That sounds great. Walking. And it, it's, it's helped me to make other decisions to optimize for say having people come to me as opposed to having to constantly bounce around a city or travel around the environs and think about how I can better use the capital I have for uh, types of leverage that don't require or replace the need for bouncing around continuously and wasting that time in transit. And also, I've, I've found for me at least very slow or very fast in terms of transportation work well. It's in the middle that I get very frustrated because if it's very slow, I can also say batch phone calls, I can listen to podcasts, listen to audiobooks, I can take time uh, for that type of enrichment in the process of moving from point A to point B. So true. Walking is so powerful and so underrated. Like your brain just goes into overdrive. All of your problems sort of start to solve themselves in the background. And for people who don't do it regularly, like an hour a day of walking to genuinely go somewhere, um, they just dis discount it because they haven't even experienced this incredible power. So I'm glad we're both on that train. <laughs> I'm on that shoe. 